بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله حمد الشاكرين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها ونور الأبصار وضيائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكرك الغافلون Today's subject is with regard to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Sharif and the city of Jerusalem for those who intend to visit the city of Baytul Maqdis and make ziyarah of the masjid regarding which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said لا تشد الرحال إلا إلى ثلاث المسجد الحرام والمسجد الأقصى ومسجد هذا which is what that the rides are not prepared you don't prepare any journey except three masajid which three masajid المسجد الحرام which is in مكة المكرمة where the Kaaba al Musharrafa is located and then المسجد الأقصى الشريف and the third one is Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi Al-Sharif. These three masajid are emphasized in the hadith for their high esteem, high virtue in Islam. And of course, in Islam, the noblest cities are what? Makkah Al-Mukarramah, Al-Madinah Al-Munawwarah, and then Baytul Maqdis, which is the city of Jerusalem. Damascus comes forth because the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam visited Damascus also in his childhood when he went on trade with Abu Talib. During that time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam visited Damascus and because of the location, having many Anbiya Ali Musalam buried there and Sahaba Ali Muridwan buried in Damascus. Cities like Baghdad were constructed later. Baghdad was constructed in the Abbasi period. So there was no city of Baghdad during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So therefore, the fifth most important city may be uh, the city of Cairo. And then you have a tartib of other cities also. But these three cities have an immense virtue because of the, the location of those masajid within those cities. And Makkah al-Mukarramah is designated as al-Haram al-Sharif. Why is Makkah al-Mukarramah al-Haram? Al-Haram means that the entire area is a sanctified area where people cannot go hunting for animals, they cannot uproot trees, with the exception of certain reasons. And the area is what deemed a sanctified area. That was sanctified in the time of Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam had the city of al madinatul al-Munawwara declared a haram. So between Jabal Uhud, which is in the north of al madinatul al-Munawwara, and Jabal Uair, which is in the south of al madinatul al-Munawwara, whatever comes in between these two mountains, from north to, to south, is a part of al haram al nabawi And then the al harratu al sharqiya and al harratu al gharbiya which are the two lava tracts on the east and the west of al madina al munawwara this signifies the boundary of the haram so uh, makkah al mukarramah is a haram and al madina al munawwara is al haram as for al masjid al aqsa the city itself is not a technical haram but Sultan Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahimahullah ta'ala, he would refer to the masjid complex, which is the Aqsa complex, as al-Haram al-Sharif, not in the technical sense, but in the sense that that region is sanctified and can never be violated and tampered. The reason for doing that was after the emancipation and victory of Sultan Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahimahullah, with his foresight, brilliant foresight, he declared that Masjid Aqsa complex as Al-Haram al-Sharif, so later generations of Muslims know that the entire complex cannot be violated.
the violation of any part of the complex is a violation of al-Masjid al-Aqsa itself. So al-Masjid al-Aqsa al-Sharif itself, what is al-Masjid al-Aqsa al-Sharif? Al-Masjid al-Aqsa al-Sharif is the land upon which the second masjid on earth, earth was constructed. So the first masjid in, a, in the Sahih Hadith, it mentions that the first masjid that was constructed was in Mecca al mukarramah and al, where al kaaba al musharrafa is located. So the Kaaba itself, al kaaba al musharrafa itself is rectangular. The original Kaaba was rectangular and it had two doors. One from where the Hatim, the second, the semicircled area is located, and the second door is the current door. So people would enter one door and they would come out of the other door. Later on, there were a few times when uh, the Kaaba was reconstructed. In history, there have been only a few times. One of those times was when the Quraysh reconstructed the Kaaba. When the Quraysh reconstructed the Kaaba, they left the semicircled area void. They placed what is known the, the wall, the semicircled wall, as a hatim. That is known as hatim. So today, when we go to the Kaaba, if you enter the hatim, you are actually entering the Kaaba itself. So the Kaaba originally is rectangular, not cube. The original structure, uh, structure is rectangular, but then later on the cube was made and the Rasulullah left it as such. So Abdullah bin Zubair radiallahu anhuma did reconstruct the Kaaba rectangular. After which, when Hajjaj bin Yusuf, when he when he martyred Abdullah bin Zubair radiallahu anhuma, he returned the Kaaba back to its original shape back to the cube shape. And similarly, the black cloth is not essential for the Kaaba, but it's become urf, the custom. So because of that, the people have kept the custom of the black cloth. The kiswa of the Kaaba does not need to be black. It can be any color, but the tradition has remained as a black kiswa. Now, Al-Masjid Al-Haram was the first masjid constructed in the time of Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam. 500 years later, on the site and the location of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, the second masjid was constructed, which is Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Sharif. But where was it constructed? The current site that we have is known as the Aqsa Complex. That is not only where the gold dome is located or where the masjid at the front in the southern direction is located. That masjid that's on the, there are two masjid buildings on the complex. But those two buildings are not only Al Masjid Al Aqsa, the entire complex is Al Masjid Al Aqsa. So the ground, when you enter the doors, you are entering the masjid. That is Al Masjid Al Aqsa. But what is the history and how did we come to the current form of Al Masjid Al Aqsa Sharif? As I mentioned, that 500 years after al kaaba al musharrafa was constructed, Sayyiduna Adam salam was commanded to construct the second masjid, which was Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. The name Al-Aqsa itself, that is the reference point in Arabic. So in Al-Quran Al-Kareem, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Subhana al-ladhi asra bi'abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-harami إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير. This verse makes a reference to Al-Aqsa, uh, glorified be he or transcendent from all faults. سبحان الذي أسرى who made his servant travel by night, ليلا at a small interval in the night من المسجد الحرام from المسجد الحرام which is in مكة المكرمة. إلى المسجد الأقصى to the furthest masjid because that is the name الذي باركنا حوله that furthest masjid that we placed our baraka our blessings in it حوله surrounding it that means the entire precinct not only the masjid but the surrounding city and the surrounding areas are blessed باركنا حوله حوله around it now 
Here it's referred to as Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Al-Aqsa means furthest masjid. This is in reference to from Makkah Al-Mukarramah, the furthest masjid at that particular point was Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. There was no masjid beyond the northern hemisphere in the northern direction beyond Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. So the name became Al-Aqsa. The Zionists today, they attempt to propagate that Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is not mentioned in Al-Quran Al-Kareem. So the common propaganda that is spread in the illegal state of Israel today amongst Jews and Arabs is that Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa has no historical reference in Al-Quran Al-Kareem. And some, a minority of people attempt to say that Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa here refers to some location in Arabia. It doesn't refer to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. But of course this is false because by un unanimity, ijma, there is consensus amongst all the Muslims that Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa historically has always referred to the masjid which is located in the city of Jerusalem today. So after the construction of Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam, as what occurred with uh, al kaabatul al-Musharrafa, with time, the building became derelict. And over time, there was tajdeed, renewal. So when different anbiya alayhi salam was sent, they would renew the construction. So Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam, he reconstructed the Kaaba, as we know in the ayat, in the verses in Surah Al-Baqarah where Sayyiduna Ismail and Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam, they reconstructed al kaabatul al-Musharrafa from its foundations and he stood, Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam stood upon a rock which is now known as what? Maqamu Ibrahim, the station of Ibrahim alayhi salam. When he stood on the rock, the two footprints became embedded in the rock. Later on, that rock was preserved. And when he would stand on the rock, the rock, would rise with him and he would construct the walls as the walls went higher. The rock was preserved and this became known as Maqam Ibrahim. The Maqam of Sayyiduna Ibrahim is ref referenced in Al Quran Al Kareem and it's a part of the rites of Hajj and Umrah that if you are able to, you pray two raka'atain, two cycles of prayer behind the Maqam of Ibrahim. In the Umrah, when you finish, you pray two cycles behind the Maqam of Ibrahim salam, if you are able to do so. Initially, the Maqam of Ibrahim salam was attached to the Kaaba itself. But later on, what happened in the time of Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anh, there were floods because the Kaaba isn't at the lowest point in Makkah al mukarramah So what happens is sometimes floods occur. And when the floods occurred, the Maqamu Ibrahim salam became detached. So they placed it in its current location. And what happened is that the, in, if you look at the pictures from uh, the Uthmani Khilafa, you will see that there is a major construction built over the Maqam of Ibrahim salam. What happened later in the time of Al-Malik Abdul Aziz, who is the founder of the Saudi dynasty, the third Saudi dynasty, what we of today is the third dynasty. He placed a smaller construction over Maqam Ibrahim, which we observe today. That is the location of the Maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And of course, the, uh, the current location is the same location as it was from the time of Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an. Only the construct that is made over it is smaller, more compact. And this was made with the consensus of a board of ulama, which was across the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, consisting of notable people also. Al-Masjid al-Haram was reconstructed, as I mentioned, in the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, but Al-Masjid al-Aqsa al-Sharif was then to be reconstructed by the descendants of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Who are those descendants? The first descendant is whom Sayyiduna Dawood alayhi salam. Now the story of how Sayyiduna Dawood alayhi salam even reached the city of Jerusalem relates of course 
to the history of Sayyiduna Musa alayhi salam because Ishaq alayhi salam and his progeny, they settled in a region. So Ibrahim alayhi salam has two children, Sayyiduna Ismail and Sayyiduna Ishaq alayhi salam, two sons who are notable from the progeny of Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam. Sayyiduna Ismail alayhi salam is made to settle in the valley of known as Bakka, which is Makkah al mukarram Sayyiduna Ishaq alayhi salam settles in an area known as Hebron, with the word Ibran, which is Hebron in English, which is in Palestine. Ishaq alayhi salam has a son who is known as Sayyiduna Ya'qub alayhi salam, in English known as Jacob, but one of his titles is what? Israel, which is the servant of Allah. Israel, il means Allah in Hebrew. And this is where the names, Jibra'il, uh, all the names, Mika'il, they're all from Hebrew. And Sayyiduna Ya'qub alayhi salam, he settles in Hebron and he has 12 children, 12 sons, as we know of the story of Sayyiduna Ya'qub alayhi salam. One of those sons is whom Sayyiduna Yusuf alayhi salam, who has a brother whose name is Bin Yamin from the same mother. Otherwise, Ya'qub alayhi salam married. The first time he had 10 children from the first wife. When she passed away, he had two children from the younger wife. Yusuf alayhi salam, then we know the story of Sayyiduna Yusuf alayhi salam in, in Al Quran al Kareem. The chapter Yusuf, chapter number 12 of Al Quran al Kareem, relates the entire story. One of the few stories in the Quran which is not repeated in the Quran again. It's only mentioned once the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. He settles in Egypt. When he settles in Egypt, his brothers migrate to Egypt. Even Sayyiduna Ya'qub alayhi salam, he is initially buried in Egypt. And then what happens in that time, the Hyksos period, in, in Egyptian history known as the Hyksos period, the Hyksos kings, they live in northern Egypt, and southern Egypt is ruled by the Fara'ina, the pharaohs. Later on, as Egyptologists will tell you, the pharaohs dominated the Hyksos, and they conquered the north. When they conquered the north, this is why in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, in Surah to Yusuf, you notice the king of Egypt is not referred to as Fir'aun, he's referred to as Malik, because the Hyksos never utilized the word Fir'aun. But later on, in the time of Musa alayhi salam, the title Fir'aun is utilized for the king. So then, as the Hebrews, which is the correct term for them, Hebrews or Bani Israel, the progeny of Yaqub alayhi salam, the real Israelites and the real Hebrews. When they resided in Egypt, they are what enslaved by whom? Fir'aun. When they are enslaved, we know the story of Musa alayhi salam. He leaves uh, Egypt, the exodus occurs, they cross according to some the Red Sea. And when they cross the Red Sea, where do they go? They go to the, si the peninsula, the Sinai Peninsula, which is mentioned in the Quran, Turi Sinin and Sina. These are names for the Sinai Peninsula. What is the Sinai Peninsula? If you look at a map, you will see the Arabian Peninsula. You will see the coast of Africa, Egypt, the coast of Egypt. From the coast of Africa, Egypt, to the coast of Arabia, in between at the top, there is a small peninsula that is known as the Sinai Peninsula. The location of Mount Sinai is on that peninsula. Today, there are some Christian evangel evangelists who attempt to say that the Sinai mountain is located on the Arabian Peninsula. But this is mukhalif lil ijma'. It goes against the consensus. From the time of the Sahaba Ali Muridwan until today, the Muslims always deemed the Sinai Peninsula as the location of the Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is on that peninsula. In fact, there is a masjid on top of the mountain. So initially the Jews, they constructed a synagogue. Then the Christians constructed a church. But then the final revelation, which is Al-Islam, the Muslims constructed a masjid, which finalizes everything. And the Mount Sinai is one of the locations which a Dajjal cannot enter. So according to some hadith, a Dajjal, the false messiah, cannot enter al-Masjid al-Haram. He cannot enter 
al-Masjid al-Nabawi. In fact, he cannot enter the city of Makkah al-Mukarramah. He cannot enter the city of what? Al-Madinah al-Munawwarah. But he cannot enter al-Masjid al-Aqsa. So the, the Masjid al-Aqsa complex, he cannot enter that. Ariel Sharan, when he attempted, he was booted out with slippers, meaning one of the greatest satans that lived in recent history. He attempted to enter the Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa complex and he was humiliated. Anyone who attempts to denigrate the Masjid from the so-called Israelis today, they will be denigrated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will be disgraced. So from this history then, Bani Israel, the children of Israel, السلام, they roamed the desert with Musa السلام, for 40 years. Why? Because we know the story, what occurred. They craft a calf, a golden calf, and then they worship the calf on the instruction of a Samiri. And then Musa السلام, descends down from the mountain, from Mount Sinai. He has the calf destroyed, and he brings the Bani Israel back to Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then they are condemned to roam the deserts. And they may have constructed small villages in the Arabian Peninsula, which explains the sites in Arabia. So when they claim that Sinai, those are not Sinai. Uh, that is not Sinai. That is when the Bani Israel were roaming in the Arabian Peninsula. They left certain historical artifacts in Jordan, in Arabia, for all this time when they roamed around as Bedouin people, as nomadic people. Then after Sayyiduna Musa السلام, passed away, and according to some, he's buried in Urika, which is Jericho. And Rasulullah on the night of Al Isra passed by his grave, as mentioned in the Sahih of an Imam Muslim. He said, uh, Rasulullah marartu bi qabri Musa. I passed by the grave of Musa السلام, عند الكفيب الأحمر, under a dread dune hill. And he was standing up praying in his grave. And then later on, some of them, Salatin, some of the Sultans, they attempted to locate the, uh, the grave and they determined it to be in Jericho. That's where the site today, the grave is in Jericho. That's according to the likes of Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi, who every year would take out an urs, an anniversary of Musa. Alayhi salam. So during Easter time, to counter the Christians, he would carry out an urs, an anniversary march from the city of Jerusalem to Jericho uh, with thousands of Muslims. They would reach the grave of Musa السلام, and then they would carry out acts of ibadah at the site. And a Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi rahimallah, would sit at a particular location and many of the Muslims would uh, want, they would leave a will a testament that they would want to be buried near the location of the grave of Musa Ali Salam. So that is where Musa Ali Salam passed away. As for Sayyiduna Harun Ali Salam, he had passed away before. So Sayyiduna Harun Ali Salam passed away before Sayyiduna Musa Ali Salam. Some of them say that he is in fact buried on top of Jabal Uhud. On the top of Jabal Uhud, to this day, there is a location which is claimed to be the grave of. Harun Ali Salam. Of course, no grave is qat'i except the grave of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Shaykhin, and also the grave of Sayyiduna Ibrahim Ali Salam, Sayyiduna Khalil in uh, Hebron, in Khalil, in the area of Khalil, which is in Jerusalem, in uh, Palestine today. It's occupied, but it's in uh, this, the town known as Hebron, which is known in Arabic as Khalil. Khalil in reference to Sayyiduna Ibrahim Ali Salam. And in ancient times, what would they do? They would go to Khalil, Muslims, they would go to Khalil, and even until recently, until 100 years ago. Of course, the Saudi dynasty took over in 1932 the entire region of Arabia. And then afterwards, the false entity of Israel was constructed and that barred the Muslims from doing what? From going to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa 
But before that, they would go to Khalil. When they would reach the city of Khalil, they would wear the ihram, the two gowns for the Hajj, near the site of the grave of Ibrahim a.s. Why? Because the, the ritual of Hajj was initiated by Ibrahim a.s. And then what would they do? They would go with the ihram. Of course, the Wahhabis would refer to this as bid'ah. But there are ulama who did this and there is a foundation for this. But today is not the subject to elaborate on that. But they would then go from Khalil to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and pray in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Two cycles. Because the reward of praying in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is the reward of 1,000 salah or 500 salah, depending on which narration you read. And then from Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, they would go to Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi Al-Sharif and convey their salam to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course, by ijma' that's permitted because all four madhahib give the fatwa of permission of visiting the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, meaning visitation of the grave of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with intention. And they would pray in Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi Al-Sharif. Then from al Madina Al-Munawwara, they would go ahead to do the Hajj. So, according to some narrations, Harun a.s. is buried on top of Mount Uhud. The location today may be barred off, or you may be able to visit the site. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But then when Bani Israel, they leave the Arabian Peninsula, they are commanded to carry out jihad at various intervals, even in the time of Musa alayhi salam. The stories that are mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf and elsewhere in Al-Quran al karim But Sayyiduna Yusha bin Nun alayhi salam then led them in jihad. When they were commanded to do jihad, they conquered various lands. Now the Old Testament, what they refer to as a Torah or the Old Testament, it has some of those accounts but it validates violence which we as Muslims do not, uh, do not hold any credence or credibility with regard to such violence. Like uh, the story of Samson and killing so many hundreds of people or the slaughter of women and children and animals mentioned in the Old Testament. In fact, the Bible is a religious text which sanctions killing of women and children, the Quran has no such sanctioning. N and neither does the hadith of Rasulullah have any sanctioning of killing women and children. Of course, the illegal state of Israel takes its teachings from the Old Testament. While in Al-Quran al -Karim, you can read the Quran from cover to cover, you will find never find any sanctioning of killing of women, children, captives, uh, innocent people. No innocent people, the leader is not instructed to kill any innocent people at all in the Quran and Sunnah. But in the Old Testament, we find guidelines for the IDF. Today you have the guidelines for the IDF found in the Old Testament. But when the Bani Israel were commanded to do jihad, one of the places where they were commanded to do jihad at a later date was the city of Jerusalem. And we find the story in Surah Al-Baqarah. Within Surah Al-Baqarah, you find the entire account where Talut is commanded to fight Jalut. Jalut in English known as Goliath. Known as Goliath the giant. And Talut has a soldier with him who is known as him, Dawood alayhi salam. Now, Dawood kills Jalut and he attains kingdom, Al Mulk. He is also referred to as Khalifa, and the, Khalifa meaning the caretaker of the earth, a, an inheritance which later would pass on to the Ummah of the Prophet in the form of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And then his successors until the Day of Judgment. But what occurred, Dawood is cons commanded to construct Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. He initiates the construction but is unable to complete it. In fact, you read the accounts, they mention accounts with regard to the land of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, how it was purchased, again, because people had taken over the land. 
and the attempt of Dawood attempting to reconstruct Al Masjid Al Aqsa. But we know through Al Quran Al Kareem that the Masjid was actually completed by whom? Sayyiduna Sulaiman. What is the story? That's the jinn kind were under the instruction of Sulaiman. And Sayyiduna Sulaiman he had the jinn. The bad jinn as captives. As captives, they constructed Al Masjid Al Aqsa Sharif. The construction was completed. By the time it was completed, Sayyiduna Suleiman had passed away. But the jinn did not realize that Suleiman was observing them leaning on a staff and he had passed away. But because the bodies of Anbiya Ali Musalam do not rot, they do not become putrid. In fact, when they are placed back in the graves, they go back to life. Their soul is placed back into them. So his body remained fresh and everything on him remained fresh. How? Like Sayyiduna Uzair Ali Salam. O Kalladi Marra ala Qaryatin wahiya khawiyatun ala Aurushia in Surah Al Baqarah. That's in reference to Sayyiduna Uzair Ali Salam. That when he passed away, if you notice in his story, his clothing didn't rot, his body didn't rot, he, the donkey had rotted away to the point that the donkey became bones. But anything attached to the Nabi stayed fresh. And this is the state of the Anbiya This is why the garments on their bodies do not rot away in the graves. So Sayyiduna Sulaiman he stayed fresh, of course, he's a Nabi of Allah. So after days of him being having passed away, the only the way they found out was the staff that he was leaning on. The staff, a creature had eaten away at the staff until the staff snapped from the weight. And then they realized that he had passed away. But by the time they scattered, the masjid had been completed. And then... When the masjid was completed, of course, the successors of Suleiman were Khulafa. They were successors. Where can we date this history of Al Masjid Al Aqsa? It becomes very difficult because the only historical data we have is the modern Bible. Of course, the modern illegal state of Israel has a team of archaeologists, an army of archaeologists attempting to validate the history from their own point of view. But of course, the modern Israeli state is actually Ashkenazi in origin, meaning not Hebrew in origin, the vast majority of them. They are not Hebrew people. They are not people uh, who are Semitic in nature, with the exceptions. There are exceptions uh, amongst them, but the vast majority of them are Ashkenazi people who settled in Europe, but prior to Europe, they came from southern Russia. I mean, they have a Turkic origin. They do not have a Middle Eastern origin. But they attempt to graph their own history onto the region. And they are attempting to find historical data which will validate their own version of history. But if we attempt to make a timeline, we can make a rough timeline if... Firstly, we locate the Pharaoh from the time of Musa Ali Salam. Some people say that Pharaoh was Ramesses II, the most plausible candidate. There are others as well. And then from Egypt, Egyptian history, you look down the dates, BC before Christ, before Isa Ali Salam, you track down the history. We know what happened, Nebuchadnezzar, who is known as Bukht Nasr in Arabic. He then does what? He enters the kingdom which is known as Israel. Because they divided amongst themselves. When they indulged in shirk, in polytheism, idolatry, and violating the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they split amongst themselves. They even placed some of them, some of their rulers placed idols in the Al Masjid Al Aqsa. They tampered their teachings. And it was at that point that 
the formulation of what is known as Judaism came about because Judaism is a racial religion ascribing itself to one tribe which is the tribe of Judah so being a Jew is an ascription to the tribe of Judah the tribe of Judah had its split with the rest of the Bani Israel and this is the formulation of what is known as Judaism Judaism is a reference to a racial religion then they were imprisoned and placed in Babylon and this is where they followed Sihr where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes reference to this in Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem regarding what ma unzila ala al-malakayn bi Babila Harut wa Marut bi Babila is in reference to Babylon that wa tabau ma tatlu shayatin ala mulk Sulaiman that they followed the shayatin what the shayatin recited in the mulk in the kingdom of Suleiman alayhi salam and wa ma unzila ala al malakayn bi babila harut wa marut and what was revealed upon the two angels harut and marut this was while they were captives in babylon babylon is where it's west of al kufa and then as captives they were scattered everywhere afterwards but then the romans permitted them to return back when they were permitted to return back to the city of jerusalem they reconstructed al masjid al aqsa and this is the time when sayyiduna isa alayhi salam he preaches to bani israel now sayyiduna isa alayhi salam is dispatched to bani israel but there is something to note his mother sayyiduna maryam alayhi salam was from bani israel but isa alayhi salam he has no father so he is not completely bani israel he is only bani israel from the aspect of his mother otherwise isa alayhi salam in terms of his father's lineage he has no father therefore he cannot be ascribed to bani israel in that sense in the sense of his father he has no father so he, he is only born from a woman so his lineage does not go through a man it goes only through sayyiduna maryam alayhi salam but at that time there is the anbiya alayhi salatu was salam like whom sayyiduna zakaria alayhi salam and sayyiduna yahya alayhi salam this is around before zero uh, the year zero before the year zero you have some anbiya alayhi salam within the city of jerusalem one of them is sayyiduna zakaria alayhi salam where is he located in al masjid al aqsa so you open surah maryam alayhi uh, salam you will find the entire story of zakaria alayhi salam where does that and occur that entire story it occurs in al masjid al aqsa and the muslims they retained the historical location so when you go to al masjid al aqsa today you will find the mihrab of zakaria alayhi salam the location is still preserved where did zakaria alayhi salam do his dua and the dua was answered that is preserved of course it's preserved by ahl sunnah wal jamaa because if the wahhabis they govern the masjid they will remove all these things never have the shia governed the city in recent history and never have the wahhabis governed the city the ahl sunnah wal jamaa they preserved all the sites so where zakaria ali salam performed the dua that area is preserved and then what happens is that sayyiduna isa ali salam he enters the city of jerusalem where does he reside he resides on the mount of olives which is east jerusalem east jerusalem today is under occupation but according to the un it should be under the palestinian authority east jerusalem so when you go to the city of jerusalem you go to east jerusalem the mount of olives is located in east jerusalem it's about 15 minute walk away from the citadel the citadel of uh, the city of jerusalem sayyiduna isa alayhi salam he enters the city and he goes into al masjid al aqsa and he finds 
Now remember, Bani Israel, those who remain of them. Bani Israel, racially, those who remain of them. They are now religiously misguided. Why are they religiously misguided? Because when they formed this false teaching of Judaism, which is not the message of Musa alayhi salam, they permit usury. And when they permit usury, they permit other things. Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam finds them carrying out the act of banking in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. So bankers are not something new. They were found even in Roman times. And then this was a profession adopted by people who happened to be of the Jewish faith, but not from Hebrew lineage, from Ashkenazi lineage, in Europe also, because usury was prohibited to the Christians. So for instance, when Richard, the so-called Lionheart, was crowned, anti-Jewish riots broke out in England. Why? Because most of the tax collectors were Jewish. And this is the source of what is referred to as anti-Semitism today in Europe. Anti-Semitism is a European problem. And Muslims should never adopt the interpretation of the Europeans with regard to the Jews. Because the Jews lived in safety in Darul Islam. They lived in safety amongst Muslims in Spain for hundreds of years. Yes, they were Ahlul Dhimma, but they lived in safety. They lived in safety in Morocco and continue to live in safety in Morocco. And they live in safety across the Muslim world in many places. So Muslims cannot adopt what is known as anti-Semitism. Of course, the Ashkenazi are not Semitic, but this narrative, because anti-Semitism developed in Europe. It's a European thing. So Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam, he enters al-Masjid al-Aqsa and he overturns the tables. And this leads to animosity of the rabbis. The rabbinical leadership is now against Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam. But this historical event occurred in al-Masjid al-Aqsa. So then they devise a plan. وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ They plotted against Isa alayhi salam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his divine will, his divine taqdeer, his qadr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the best of what divine, uh, the best of what uh, in his knowledge with regard to anyone. So what happened at that point is that Isa alayhi salam, he has the, meet, uh, the meeting with his companions who are known in Christianity as apostles. And they meet up for the last supper. Where do they meet? They meet near the grave of Dawood alayhi salam. So today when you go to the city, to Jerusalem, you will go to the, the grave of Dawood alayhi salam. When you go to the grave of Sayyiduna Dawood alayhi salam, you present your salam to Sayyiduna Dawood alayhi salam, you will notice the occupiers, the, the Israeli, so-called Israeli occupiers who are occupying the site. But they prohibit Muslims from going upstairs into the masjid, which was constructed by Salahuddin al-Ayubi, rahimallah, in the upstairs hall, which is the location of the Last Supper. Why did the Muslims construct that masjid? To preserve the area of, uh, where Sayyiduna Isa al -Salam had visited. But if you go up, you will find that there is a masjid, but they do not permit anyone to utilize the masjid because it's an occupation now. They leave the masjid derelict. And it's an attempt to finish off Muslim history in Jerusalem. So when you go to give salam, you go and give salam to Sayyiduna Dawood alayhi salam, you do not show any type of respect to the occupiers. A Muslim should never show any type of respect to them. You should ignore them. You ignore them entirely. You do not pay any attention to them. Act as if they are not there. And you go and you give salam to Sayyiduna Dawood alayhi salam, ignore them completely, the occupiers. And then you can go up to the masjid and visit the masjid also. You will see the location. And nearby is what is known as the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane is where Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the Roman soldiers arrived. And according to many of these commentators, then... Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam was raised at that point. 
which is referenced in the Quran, which is Qatiyu Dalala, that Isa a.s. was raised up at that point. What occurred later, we know from the history, like historians like Josephus, in his antiquities, he mentions that the entire city of Jerusalem later was what ransacked by the Romans because of zealots, uh, the uh, rebellion against the Romans, where the Bani Israel attempted to take over the city. And then the Romans vanquished all the Bani Israel. They were scattered across the earth, uh, which became known as the diaspora, with this, the scattering of uh, Bani Israel across the world. Some of them are real Bani Israel, like some of the Bani Israel in Yemen, the ones in Yemen or in Iraq, or in Syria, or in Egypt, or in Morocco. These are real Bani Israel. Some, many of them became Muslim. They entered the fold of Islam, like Abdullah bin Salam. They became Muslims, or uh, many of them adopted Islam, and they entered the fold of Islam. And today, some of what we know as Palestinians are, in fact, Bani Israel, genetically speaking. The minority of Bani Israel that remained in other countries who stayed on the Judaic religion, they are the real Bani Israel. So when the Ashkenazis, they adopted Judaism. When did they adopt Judaism? In around the 7th century, 7th century Christian era. When they adopted Judaism, they became known as Jews also. And they settled in Europe. Now, of course, you have the history of how the modern Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, they were persecuted in Europe and then formulated the state of Israel, an illegal entity within the Palestinian lands. And then they brought in all the various types of Bani Israel from across the world. Because some of them who believe in an apocalyptic interpretation of the Torah, they believe that the Akhir Zaman cannot. The Messiah cannot appear, what they know as Mashiach. He cannot appear until all the Bani Israel are located in Jerusalem, in that surrounding area. So they even attempt to entice some of the Afghanis who have uh, Bani Israel genetic to come to uh, the illegal entity of Israel. But the problem is that some of those Afghanis, they are what? They are Muslims. They also attempt some of the people of Kashmir who have Bani Israel genetic to come to the state of Israel. But the problem they have is that they are also Muslims. So then what occurs when the Romans, they attack the city of Jerusalem, they desecrate the city and they violate the sanctity of the Masjid, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Sharif. The Masjid site is left. Some of the remnants of the masjid remain, the walls, like we have today. For instance, you go around Britain, you will find ancient sites which go back to over 2,000 years. But not many years went by in comparison. Only a few hundred years went up to the point of Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj. So when Rasulullah travels from the night journey in Makkah al Mukarramah to Al Masjid al Aqsa, the site of the masjid is still there. The ancient ruins are still there because the Romans did not permit anyone to go onto the site. In fact, they only permitted people to utilize the site for heaping rubbish at a certain point. They only allowed people to place their rubbish, the Christians. The Romans, when they adopted Christianity, Paulian Christianity, because the message of Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam was Islam. It was not anything different to Islam. But then the, the message of Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam was tampered by Paul. Now Paul was, who was known as Saul of Tarsus. He was originally from Turkey. But racially he was Bani Israel. He had a conversion, a sudden conversion on the road to Damascus. When he had this sudden conversion, which is a common thing with sometimes when someone is zealot, a zealot 
against something so bad, psychologically they can have sometimes a conversion into that thing. So if someone goes overboard regarding any sect or overboard with regard to any religion, sometimes psychologically they can have a conversion to that religion or conversion to that sect. It is mentioned by psychiatrists like William Sargent in his book, The Battle for the Mind. It explains why Paul had this sudden conversion. But Paul then tampered the teachings of Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam. And he, of course, had adversity with James. James was known as the brother of Isa alayhi salam. Whether he is acknowledged as the brother of Isa alayhi salam in Islam, in Christianity he is known as James, the brother of Jesus. So there were two conflicting teachings. There was the real teaching of Isa alayhi salam, which is Islam. And there was the conflicting teaching of Paul of Tarsus. Paul of Tarsus, he tampers the teaching of Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam, but the teaching spreads. And we know that some of the companions of Isa alayhi salam preached Islam. So in Surah to Yasin, for instance, you have the story of the people who go to a town and preach in Surah Yasin. Similarly, in Surah Al Kahf, the story of the people of the cave, the people, the seven youngsters who fell asleep in the cave, they were people who adopted real Islam and the real teaching of Isa alayhi salam. Likewise, you have St. Peter's Basilica in Rome today. St. Peter's Basilica is supposedly the site where St. Peter, Peter the Rock, who Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam said according to the New Testament, according to the Christian teaching, that I shall build my church on you, meaning a rock. And what happened, they say that he went to Rome to preach Islam. It must have been Islam. And what happened, that the Romans persecuted him and killed him, and he was buried on that site. So the Vatican Church is literally constructed upon the body and the tomb of St. Peter. So this type of Christianity spread. And when eventually uh, Constantine, the emperor, who constructed Constantinople on seven hills, like Rome was constructed on seven hills, when he adopted Paulian Christianity and they selected only four gospels from all the hundreds of gospels, of course, four tampered gospels, the Christians then persecuted the Jews even more. So the Romans already persecuted what became known as Judaism. But genetically, Bani Israel, or anyone who adopted Judaism became known as a Jew. So you had two types. You had people who were racially the people who were Hebrew, and they stayed Jewish in religion. They adopted the religion of Judaism, meaning not the deen of Musa, salam, which was is Islam. And then you had people who believed in Judaism, but racially they were not Bani Israel, they became known as Jews also, like Ka'ab al-Ahbar. Ka'ab al-Ahbar was an Arab, but he adopted Judaism. And then later on, he became a Muslim. But genetically, he was an Arab. But you had some of the Bani Israel located in Al-Madina al munawwarah They were actually Bani Israel. They had lineages back to Musa a.s. They had lineages back to Harun a.s. They were real Bani Israel. Later, many of them adopted Islam, but most of them, they were scattered. You know the story of what happened after Khaybar, that they were taken as captives. And then in the time of Sayyiduna, uh, many of them were made to uh, exile the Arabian Peninsula, uh, which modern-day Israel, by the way, makes an issue with regard to the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, which is not the subject of today. But... What happened then when they scattered across the globe, they either adopted other religions or became Muslim, and some of them remained as minorities throughout the world. But at that point, the Ashkenazi Jews also adopted Judaism and became known as Jews also. So when asked, when the Christians, the Roman Christians persecuted Bani Israel, they did not give importance to the location of Al Masjid al Aqsa. So, what occurs after Al Isra al Mi'raj, the conquest of Jerusalem, 
under a leader which who is known as whom Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala an who is also prophesied in the original Torah in the original Torah Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu an is prophesied as the one who will conquer the city what happens remember there was a companion known as Sayyiduna Tamim al-Dari radiyallahu an a Palestinian companion which is important because this Palestinian companion is the only companion who ever saw the Dajjal, along with his own companions who were from the tribe of Lakhm. They were Arabs from Lakhm. They, they traveled from the Mediterranean Sea. They became lost, perhaps in a vortex, perhaps in a parallel universe, perhaps on a real island on earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. You can never speculate. But what happened? They met a Dajjal in the famous long hadith of Tamim al-Dari, radiallahu anh, which is important because a Dajjal is a Jewish Messiah. He is the Jewish Messiah. He is the Mashiach. But a Palestinian meets him. This is a point to note. Then the same Sahabi, Tamim al-Dari, is the same Sahabi who brings the oil from Palestine to al-Masjid al-Nabawi, a Sharif. But not only oil, he brings the lamp. So prior to Tamim al-Dari radiallahu an entering al-Masjid al-Nabawi al-Sharif, when they needed uh, light at night time, they would make a fire in the middle of the masjid. When they would make a fire in the middle of the masjid, uh, that was how they lighted up the masjid. Later on, Sayyiduna Tamim al-Dari radiallahu an he brings lamps, oil lamps, from al-Masjid al-Aqsa al-Sharif. And this is important because Rasulullah then exhorts the people saying whoever is able to, the meaning of which is, go to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, he should go and pray two cycles of prayer. And in one narration, there is a reward mentioned for the one who places lamps lighting in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Why is that mentioned? Palestine has no lack of oil lamps but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is alluding to and Allah knows best with regard to the occupation of the masjid and the upkeep of the masjid in akhiru zaman in the end of time now this companion Tamim al-Dari radiallahu an Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a will written for him what was the will that the land of Khalil, the, what is known as Hebron, belongs to Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anh. So the entire land of Hebron belongs to Tamim al-Dari, and there is another region also located in Palestine which is given to Tamim al-Dari. So that means the land of Khalil belongs to Tamim al-Dari and his descendants, Muslim descendants, based upon what? The written document of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So no occupation is ever permitted. So if any ruler today says that we permit the, uh, the so-called Israelis to stay occupying on the land, that will never be validated in Al-Islam. Abdullah bin Bayya and others can write as many fatawa as they want. The land remains the land of the Muslims until the end of times. Otherwise, why would the companions Ali Muridwan have shed their blood for the land? They would be answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Yawm al-Qiyamah to all those Sahaba who shed their blood on the land for the emancipation of the land from the Roman occupation. So then what happens? Great companions from amongst Al-Ashratul Mubashara whom Abu Ubaidah bin Al-Jarrah radiallahu an, great companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and others they are the conquerors of what Asham, Bilad Asham, and Sayyiduna Khalid bin Al Walid. They conquer cities like Jerusalem, but they also conquer which city? Jeru uh, Damascus and other cities. But when they enter Damascus, they enter from two directions. They enter from the east and the west. Some of them enter as conquerors from one direction. Another group of them enter with a peace deal. Both of the armies meet in the middle of what is Al-Masjid Al-Umwawi today. 
Now, Al Masjid Al Umawi, historically, it was the temple for Saturn. First, it was the temple for Saturn for the Romans. Then, when the Romans adopted Christianity, they made it a church. When the Sahaba conquer Al Masjid Al Umawi, remember which Nabi is buried in the Masjid? Sayyiduna Yahya, alayhi salam, his head is buried in the Masjid. Sayyiduna Yahya, alayhi salam. So the Christians had preserved the head of Yahya Ali Salam and they buried the head in the church. But what happens? Two segments of the armies of the Sahaba enter. One conquers through war, the other one enters through peace from the other gate. Half the church is then made into a masjid, showing that a Sultan Muhammad al Fatih, rahimahullah ta'ala, did no wrong by making Hayya Sophia into a masjid. It's the sunnah of the Sahaba Ali Muridwan. Half the church is made into a masjid. The other half is left. Why? Because they gave the city in peace. So when we conquer with peace, we leave the church. When we conquer by war, we have the right to ch change holy sites into our own holy sites. That is the legal stance. So later on, during the Bani Umayyah rule, some of the, the Khalifas of the Bani Umayyah, one of them, he purchased the rest of the church. So half of Al-Masjid Al-Umawi was conquered and made into a masjid by ijma' of the companions, consensus of the Sahaba. And then the other half was purchased and made into a masjid. They purchased that. The entire story is found in Al-Bidayah wa Nihayah of Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala. Likewise, they enter Jerusalem, but prior to entering Jerusalem, the bishop of Jerusalem gives away the city. He gives away the city on the condition that the leader of the Muslims, which is Sayyiduna Umar ibn Khattab, عن, he can enter the city. So what did the Muslims do? They left all the churches. So the, the site of the Holy Sepulchre, the claim that Isa was crucified on the site of the church of the sepulchre, the church is left. The church of the nativity is left. The Muslims leave their churches intact. They do not forcibly make the churches into masajid. This is why the claim that a Sultan Muhammad al Fatih did a wrong thing is a wrong claim. A Sultan Muhammad al Fatih was a pious, righteous ruler who is mentioned in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then, what happens? They write a letter, the Sahaba, the conquering companions, Ali Muridwan, they write a letter to Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an, he carries out Majlis Sushura, consultation. In that consultation, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an, he gives the best advice. He says, if you do not go and take the city through peace, the Romans, the Christian Romans, will have a change of mind. And then they will regroup against the Muslims. So Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an, he marches out to the city of Jerusalem. The story is well known that he rode one camel with his servant Aslam, and then he reaches the, the citadel, and he reaches a mountain which is known as Jabal Mukabbir. Because when he reached the mountain, you will see this mountain in the city of Jerusalem. He saw Al Masjid Al Aqsa from far, meaning the site. And he said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So the mountain became known as Jabal Mukabbir, the mountain of the one who says Takbir. And then the bishop takes him around the city of Jerusalem and he gives them guarantees. But he also writes down the Shurut Umari, the conditions for the Christians. There are conditions, limitations of what they can and cannot do. And they are made Ahlul Jizya, that they must give Jizya, which is the solution for the current occupation that the Muslims must demand from the residents, Jews and Christians, Jizya. They will have safety and the Sharia of Allah rules. That is the solution. That Jews can reside in Jerusalem, Christians can reside in Jerusalem, but they must pay jizya and be ruled under 
the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? They can rule themselves according to the Torah. The Jews can rule themselves according to the Torah. The Christians can rule themselves according to the Injil and the Torah. But the, they must pay jizya to the Muslims. That is the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the only peaceful solution also. The other solutions are not peaceful. So then Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an, the famous story in the, the church of the sepulchre, he prays outside and the Muslims constructed a masjid which is known as Masjid Umar radiallahu an. And then what happens? He is taken to the site of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. He observes that the Christians have been throwing, dumping so many things on the site out of hatred for Judaism. So what does Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an command? He commands everyone to clean the site. So they clean the site. The entire complex is cleaned. And then he says he takes shura, consultation. Where should we construct the masjid? So the entire site is a masjid. But a limited building needs to be constructed for salah, for prayer. So Ka'ab al-Ahbar, who was a convert from Judaism to Islam, an Arab convert, which shows that Islam has no such concept as anti-Semitism because Rasulullah had a wife who was genetically Bani Israel, Sayyidatuna Safiya alayhi salam. There is no racial uh, hatred in Islam. But what happened, Ka'ab al-Ahbar, he advised that the masjid be constructed behind the Sakhr. What is the Sakhr? The Sakhr is the, the rock. Now what is this rock? This in Judaism is known as the Holy of Holies. So if you read the Old Testament, when they needed to present a sacrifice to God, they would go to the Holy of Holies and they would sacrifice on the rock for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what is the significance of the rock in Islam? That rock, in one hadith narrated by Ibn Majah, As-sakhru min al-jannati wal-ajwatu min al-jannati. As-sakhratu min al-jannati. The rock, meaning the rock in Jerusalem, is from paradise. And the ajwa dates are from paradise. So from what we say, this rock was the qibla of all the previous Anbiya alayhi wa And was also the qibla for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Makkah al-Mukarramah would pray in the direction of the Kaaba, behind the Kaaba, in such a way that it was facing Jerusalem at the same time. This is how Muslims would pray until that was abrogated in al Madina al munawwara So the Sakhr was the Qibla for all the previous Anbiya alayhi wa salatu wa salam. So that is the importance of the rock. So the rock is the center point of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, which is the complex. But Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an wanted to know where shall we construct our building for Salah. So Ka'ab al-Ahbar said behind the rock. Why behind the rock? So we can face the rock. Uh, Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an did not like this advice because he said you still have some Jewish beliefs within you. So he decided to build the masjid ahead of the rock, which became known as Al-Qibali, Al-Masjid Al-Qibali, which is the masjid in the Qibla direction. So the masjid where most of the Muslims pray today is the one in the Qibla direction. But the Muslims still preserved the rock and they had a masjid, Abdul Malik bin Marwan constructed the current site of the Golden Dome. So the dome of the rock was constructed by Abdul Malik bin Marwan showing that the rock is also of importance. This means Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is the entire complex. So if someone claims today, meaning the current occupying forces, they claim that the Muslims can have their masjid, which they mean Al-Qibali. But we should have our own synagogue on the site of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, which is the entire complex. This is totally impermissible in Islam. And any fatwa or any mufti who gives such a fatwa is misguided 
Such a person is a miscreant. Such a person is an agent of a Dajjal. If they say, if they give a fatwa in the future that we can have a church or a synagogue located on the Al Masjid Al Aqsa, the complex, this is totally impermissible. And such a person has sold his deen. He has sold his deen to the Zionist entity. So when we talk about the preservation of Al Masjid Al Aqsa Sharif, it's the entire complex is a masjid for the Muslims. It means the preservation of the, the Sakhra, which is the stone, and the golden dome on the, the, the masjid which has been constructed, and Al-Qibali, the masjid at the front, as well as the entire complex. Now what happened at a later date, we know of the Christian crusader conquest of Jerusalem, and the occupation, and then the emancipation, under a Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi radiallahu an. But what happened after the conquering of Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi rahimallahu ta'ala was that he placed all uh, markings on all the historical sites. And then a Dawlatul Uthmaniyya, the, the Uthmani Caliphate, they also placed markings all over the Aqsa complex. So when you go today, to Al-Aqsa complex, you will see different markings, Musalla markings, various markings. Each one of these has a historical significance. Like a certain alim may have prayed in a certain place, or a certain nabi may have play, prayed in a certain place. There is his, history behind the mihrabs that they constructed. Every single marking has a history. Therefore, the entire site is... Um, belongs to Islam, belongs to the Muslims. In fact, the entire city, Jerusalem, belongs to Islam. So those markings left by the Ottomans is something when you visit, you must find out the historical re relevance of those markings. There are over 200 markings. What is the future of the city? The future of the city is mentioned by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Khilafah will move from city to city. It has moved from al Madina al Munawwara. Remember, whenever the Khilafah moves from a city, it doesn't go back to that city. The Khilafah moved from al Madina al Munawwara to al Kufa under the rule of Sayyiduna Ali. Radiyallahu then from al Kufa, it moved to Damascus, Damishq under the rule of Muawiyah radiallahu an, after the peace with the Imam al-Hasan radiallahu an. Then, from Damascus, it moved to the city of Baghdad, which was constructed by Banu Abbas. Then from Baghdad, momentarily, it moved to where? To Cairo. And then from Cairo, it moved to Istanbul, to Constantinople. Constantinia, and it was abolished in Constantinople, formally in 1924. But we know prior to that, under the last real Khalifa, was a Sultan Abdul Hamid al Thani, rahimahullah ta'ala. But the Khilafah shall return, and the Hadith mentions that it shall return and it will conquer the city of Jerusalem. So that is the future. The city will be reconquered. It will be reconquered by Muslims who realize their ubudiyah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Muslims realize their ubudiyah and become real servants of Allah, they will conquer the city of Jerusalem. And then when they conquer the city, they will allow the Jews and the Christians and any other faith to live peacefully, peacefully in the city with the jizya. And they will become Ahlu Dhimma, which is people of protection. They will be protected by the Muslims. And that is the future of the city of Jerusalem. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he restored the city of Jerusalem and the Palestinian lands back to Ahlul Islam and not to any nationalist entity, to the Khilafah insha'Allah ta'ala in the future. Jazallahu anna Sayyidina Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam ma huwa ahluh. سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين